Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. 6, 56 degrees. Here's a quick little clip that tells you a little bit more about uh, what I do. So, sorry, the sound's kind of low. Uh, so, here is a little clip that was done by National Science Foundation talking about the work that I do with uh, DreamWorks Animation. So, these are um, animators at um, DreamWorks. And I'm mentioning that uh, anatomy is something that um, doctors study, but also um, artists. And physics is now something which is useful for animators in uh, creating uh, films. Um, this is Cassidy Curtis. He was the animator for Toothless on um, uh, How to Train Your Dragon. And he was uh, mentioning how he was using physics to um, really engage the audience by making uh, toothless uh, motion very believable. So, uh, but what I specifically wanted to, to tell you about uh, tonight was scale, the question of scale. How do you, in a film, make uh, something look enormously large or, in the case of Ariete, uh, very small? So, what is it that um, makes these machines look monstrously big, uh, these dragons from How to Train Your Dragon, why is it that they uh, feel small? And uh, I did a lot of research on this topic uh, because DreamWorks asked me to consult on the film Trolls. And in the film Trolls, how, how many of you have seen the film Trolls? Oh, good, good. So it's, I think it's coming to Netflix, so um, you'll be able to uh, see it if you haven't seen it already. So in Trolls, they wanted to have a world somewhat like uh, in Ariete, where you have some very small characters, and the directors wanted to make sure that the, the, it felt like the trolls were small. Okay, so uh, so the, the borrowers uh, are sort of similar to the trolls in that they're about four inches tall. And that makes them about 16 times small, smaller than we are. And the, the question we want to answer is, what would they be like? Uh, what's their world like? And most importantly for the filmmakers, how can uh, we bring the audience into that world and make it feel like, like a believable world? Because uh, if, you're, if you're my size, it's different than if you're this guy, okay? So the question is, uh, what's different, besides our hairstyles, uh, between myself and, and someone like, like my friend here? So, uh, now, the simplest way of establishing scale is simply to present things of known size. And then, um, as in this example, we see uh, Arietti standing next to the flowers. In the film, they have establishing shots where we, we see uh, Tokyo and uh, our uh, normal human world, and then we meet uh, the borrowers. And uh, by comparison with known things, uh, we know they're small. Now, uh, this is more of a challenge uh, when a film is, has a fantasy world, as in Trolls, because uh, it's, it's very much a fantasy world, not as connected to the real world. And so the question would be, well, is it that the trolls are small and these other characters which are in the film, which are human-sized, um, are the trolls tiny and the Bergen human-sized, or are the trolls human-sized and the Bergen's 60-foot giants? So it's more of a, more of a challenge in, in this case. Besides just things of known size, there are many other aspects that uh, tell you about the size of things. And these are aspects 
mostly connected to physics, which help the filmmakers establish scale. So one of the, one of the basic things is timing. So uh, if I drop something the size of a baseball from a height equal to its diameter, it takes about three frames uh, to reach the ground, a bowling ball falls one diameter in, in six frames. So uh, translating this to the, for the borrowers, if I, um, if, if I drop this, it takes uh, 12 frames to hit the ground. That's um, half a second. Uh, for, for, my, for my friend here, if he drops something from shoulder height, it only takes uh, three frames to hit the ground. So being 16 times smaller, everything goes uh, four times uh, faster. So everything is brisk and quick in the world of the borrowers. Uh, another um, aspect is uh, things like uh, collapsing, uh, explosions. All of these have a similar uh, timing effect. And in fact, filmmakers have used this for a long time by making use of scale models. So uh, here you, we see a shot from uh, the first Terminator film where they have a tanker truck exploding and it was not practical to uh, do this with a real tanker truck because that location is next to the uh, uh, Los Angeles police uh, armory. So, um, so instead they did it with a scale model. Uh, so the scale model is uh, nine times smaller than the tanker truck. They explode it but in order to make it not look like it's a tiny truck, they film it with a high-speed camera, film it at three times the speed, and then when they play it back at regular speed, uh, the explosion appears as if it's nine times larger. Okay, so this is uh, how they do practical effects in films. Um, we, uh, we use this to uh, our advantage in um, Madagascar 3, uh, to shoot reference to see what uh, the scene would look like in which the plane is flying around with a 70-foot chain of monkeys hanging from the bottom of the, train, uh, of the plane and the animators wanted to know what would the, the swinging chain of monkeys actually look like. So we, uh, we got an intern, a model plane, and a two-foot chain and we filmed it with a high-speed camera and adjusted the timing so that uh, this scales to a, um, what a 70 foot chain of monkeys would look like, so, more or less. Uh, uh, another thing about, uh, related to this is the timing of uh, the cadence of walking. So uh, the timing of your leg swinging is similar to that of a pendulum swinging and so the longer the leg is the slower the timing of the swinging motion. Uh, that's why uh, these um, at-ats from uh, Empire Strikes Back, these were actually done with uh, animated models which were only like a foot tall or two feet tall. So they did it with stop motion animation, but they adjusted the timing so that they're slow and so they appear to be large lumbering machines. Uh, now, um, Although they have a very slow cadence, uh, because they have long legs, something which is, which is big, uh, the timing is slower, but the distance covered by a st each step is larger. Uh, so um, you can do all these calculations for borrowers, and a borrower takes, uh, sorry, a human takes about one second to take two steps walking a borrower would be four times faster in their walking. But because they have tiny legs, <laughs> they uh, actually walk more slowly. So um, about four times slower than, than we walk. So walkers, uh, borrowers, they're, you know, they're, they're really quick, brisk steps. But because they're tiny, they don't actually, in terms of miles per hour, go very fast. Uh, another effect at small scales is uh, surface tension and stiction are very significant. So when we see pod um, climbing up the wall just using sticky tape, uh, this is obviously not something you can do at home. Even if you have a lot of duct tape, you're not going to be able to climb the walls. Um, 
And then also, we see a lot of water in the film, and uh, you see when she's pouring the, the tea, they always have the water is very sticky, um, big drops. We see her Arietti brushing the drops off her dress. So all of these keep reminding you that uh, the borrowers are small, okay? You, you, you see them in the world, but uh, these things keep uh, reinforcing over and over again that their world is different from our world, and their world is the tiny world. Now, um, there's a lot of things that we can figure out about how borrowers um, should be by using this principle called allometry. So it turns out that a lot of characteristics of creatures follow physical principles. Uh, here I've just uh, present one of them, which is heartbeat. So if you graph for all different mammals their heart rates uh, versus their size, it all falls on a, on a line. And this principle is called allometry. So uh, for example here, um, mice, uh, 630 beats per minute, uh, donkey, uh, 37 beats per minute. Uh, so we can calculate a number of things for uh, borrowers. Uh, their heart rate would be 400 beats per minute. Uh, they would breathe about 100 breaths per minute. So they would be... <laughs> they didn't do that in the film. It's very, uh, very distracting. Uh, but, but that's how they would actually breathe. Uh, their metabolism would be extremely high. Uh, small creatures have higher metabolisms. That means that they would eat a lot. Um, and in fact, you see them in the film. They, they have rather large portions in their, in their meals. Um, now, allometry works because of a very basic uh, principle, which was actually first pointed out by Galileo, which is that uh, as things get larger or smaller, the area varies as the square of the size, but the volume varies as the cube of the size. Um, you see that just in this very simple example with a block. Uh, uh, one very basic example of this, if I have uh, something, uh, you know, a character which is two feet tall, like the, a cat, like Puss in Boots, uh, that might weigh seven pounds, but a six-foot character is three times taller, but that's 27 times the volume, so that's 27 times the weight. So um, that's a very simple example of this, of this area, size, volume. What's important in using this is that uh, as you make bones larger and larger, the strength of the bone varies with the area, cross-sectional area, not the volume. The volume determines the weight of the bone, but the cross-sectional area determines the strength of the bone. And for this reason, small creatures have skinny, thin bones, and the larger and larger the creature, the thicker uh, the bones are, and in fact, the bones make up more of the creature, okay? So you see here with a uh, skeleton of a rabbit is only 9% of its weight. For an elephant, it's 27% of its weight. Um, so we can figure out the, this for the borrowers. So uh, human skeletons, 18% of your weight. Uh, for the borrowers, it would only be 7% of their weight. Um, uh, so they would, have, they would have really thin, skinny bones. That's what little creatures have. They would not be fragile. They just don't need uh, thick bones because they, they don't weigh very much. Uh, this also affects the posture of small creatures. Small creatures uh, tend to slouch. Uh, we are larger creatures, we're not that large, but the larger creatures like horses and elephants, they have to stand straight because if they don't, their bones don't support their weight. Okay? It's not enough to have thicker bones, you have to actually stand straighter. Um, and uh, animators have used this in order to establish the size of, of creatures in, in films. Uh, for example, these uh, dragons in How to Train Your Dragon, they're supposed to be about the size of an iguana. Um, these are baby dragons. 
And so the character design is such that their posture is similar to an iguana. Uh, if it was a straighter posture of a Komodo dragon, they would feel larger. If it was a, a lizard, it would feel like it was a smaller creature. Okay. These are things that, that we may not overtly realize, but uh, it works to establish the size of what we're looking at. Uh, now, of course, the borrowers uh, don't slouch because it's unappealing. Uh, little creatures like this pygmy marmoset, uh, mice, uh, they slouch. Little creatures slouch. Borrowers don't slouch. This is the case where the filmmaker says, no, I don't want to have the creature. I don't want to have the borrowers, you know, like uh, Neanderthals. Uh, that's just not good, and so fine. It, yeah. Uh, Couple of, just a couple of other things to mention. The uh, maximum falling speed. Uh, small creatures never reach a very fast uh, falling speed, no matter what the height from which they fall, just because air resistance goes as area and weight, uh, force of gravity goes as volume. So um, you can calculate for borrowers, uh, regardless of height, the borrowers would never uh, fall faster than about seven or eight miles per hour. Uh, so borrowers would have no fear of heights. It's impossible for them to be killed by falling uh, regardless of height. And we see that sort of throughout the film. Uh, you couldn't pay me enough money to walk on these <laughs> things if it, <laughs> at, that, at that height. Um, a similar thing that I mentioned to bone strength, uh, muscle strength, uh, the um, Strength of the muscle scales as the cross-sectional area. And um, this tells you that small creatures, uh, as you get smaller, uh, if they have similar, similar scaled uh, muscles, are going to be strong for their size. Uh, so they, don't, they can't lift a lot of weight, but compared to their body weight, they lift a lot. So um, let's say that you can lift 90 pounds a comparable borrower uh, would, uh, would only lift, lift six ounces, but if 90 pounds is half your body weight, that's eight times the body weight of a borrower. And throughout the film, we see the borrowers actually displaying somewhat exceptional strength. Uh, you know, this sugar block that she's carrying, just imagine that's concrete, okay, because that's how the density of sugar is. So um, a 14-year-old girl carrying uh, big, a shovel with a huge couple of cinder blocks of concrete. Uh, and then finally, uh, interestingly, the height at which uh, creatures jump uh, happens to be independent of their size. Because there's, there's actually three factors involved. Uh, the height that you can jump depends on the strength of your muscles, the length of your legs, the longer the legs, the higher you can jump. The stronger your muscles, the higher you can jump. What works against you is your weight. So the heavier you are, the less height you get. Uh, those three factors actually end up uh, balancing each other out. And so basically, um, a mouse can jump about as high as a cat, can jump about as high as, as we can. Um, and. Uh, this was another thing which was not used in the film. Uh, they use it in trolls. The trolls jump really high, but we never see the borrowers jump very high. In fact, in this scene where a homily has to be uh, pulled out of the jar, um, she should have just been able to jump right out of the jar with no problem. Okay. Um, so, uh, but again, the directors will use these principles as they find useful, but in some cases, it, it's better for the story, better for the film uh, to, to not use it, and as long as uh, the audience accepts it, that's, that's perfectly fine. So just to, just to conclude, uh, it, it may seem strange that you're using science um, within, within films, but, but if you think about it, science uh, helps create better, better medicine, better cars, better wine. <laughs> um, so, so science can be applied to many things, and 
if you can make a better film by making, making use of science, then uh, I think that's, that's very worthwhile. And, and the way you do it is science can help filmmakers create interesting worlds that the audience can then visit for the story that the filmmaker wants to make. Anyway, that's what uh, I wanted to tell you about. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of Q&A after that. So we're going to bring Tucker up. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. We'll put you in the chairs in the hot seat. Um, Tucker, do you have a question to start it off? And then anybody who can stay that wants to do a Q&A, we'll have about 10 minutes where you can ask uh, either Tucker or Dr. Garcia a question. I know some of these students have to do a school night. So Tucker, sure. do you have something you want to ask? I sure do. You've consulted on a few films where both science are at play and a great deal of artistry. Mm -hmm. Do you feel sometimes um, torn when you want to advise, you want to give advice on how to make a, a, a movie more scientifically accurate, but the director says, no, that just doesn't feel right? Um, no, I'm actually never, I'm never torn because uh, if something, it, these films are not documentaries. If, if they were documentaries, then yes, it would be important to um, have that accurate. But uh, the filmmakers know what story they want to they want to tell, and uh, they are professionals in terms of um, knowing what's going to work best for the film. Now they are very receptive because often uh, I can point out something to them that they hadn't thought of, and they say, "Oh yes, that that would work great in the film. That would really help uh, what what we're trying to do in the film." So that's that's really that's really my role. Um, the one of the one of the directors once told me that uh, the notes that I gave him. About a, about a third of them he used, about a third of them he threw away because uh, the film would be worse, and about a third of them he threw away because it was going to be too much work to do what I, what I wanted him, what I, what I suggested to him, so, yeah. But that's fine, I'll, I'll take one in three. So, that's pretty good batting average, actually. Can we open so. it up, Michael? Please, yes, yeah. questions for Oh, we got the Yes, you, sir. Oh, great, there you go. here comes the microphone. So this may come under the heading of something that got thrown away, but um, Ariadne was pretty small, so I'm, I'm imagining that because of the size of her vocal cords, she'd be pretty hard to hear. Yes. Volume. Yes. Uh, again, yeah. uh, by the way, a lot of the things I showed you, I calculated for trolls, um, and, and it's pretty similar for borrowers. And, and what you just mentioned, I also calculated for trolls. Uh, her, the volume of her voice would be about 40 decibels lower. Um, and the pitch of her voice would be about eight octaves higher. Uh, uh, sorry, four octaves higher. Um, to give you a sense, four octaves is about from the middle of the piano to the top of the piano. Um, this also was thrown, <laughs> this obviously was thrown away here and in um, uh, Trolls because it would be very annoying to listen to <laughs> <laughs> little peeping sounds. Uh, in some films, they make use of the, the the decibel thing, like Horton hears a who. You know, the who's have very low volume. Um, but yes, in, in most cases, they don't scale the voices. Beautiful, Crystal. You had somebody over here who had a question. Yeah. I was wondering, at what point do you get? involved? Are you in, do you look at storyboards before a lot of the work happens or does it get created and then you step in and say, no, this doesn't quite yeah. track? Uh, it, it, it depends. In, on, some, on some films, uh, like Madagascar 3, it was uh, already at storyboards and then you know, from the initial passes of the animation. Uh, but in some films, like on Trolls, uh, they, they were just starting the film and they wanted some ideas about uh, the creation of the world. Um, and, in some, and, and in some cases, it's not even been attached to a particular film so much. They um, maybe want to know more about uh, lighting and cinematography 
Um, or it may be one special aspect of a film, like uh, the film Home had a lot of bubbles, and so the, the effects department wanted to know everything about bubbles and how to make them look good. So, so it, it sort of varies from, from film to film. Anybody questions? Crystal, can we get right down here in the front right there? Thank you. Um, when you were mentioning how, like, because of their size, their voices were a lot higher, does their size also affect their hearing? Because I noticed in one part of the film, Arietti could hear her mother mm -hmm. all the way from the house, but they were all the way out on the other end of the property. Yeah, that, um, it, it does affect their hearing in that they would be more sensitive to higher frequencies. Um, Higher frequencies don't travel as well as low frequencies, so in that sense, it would be counter. Uh, but yeah, it's something that that was that was a plot point that they needed, <laughs> so they so they did that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're um, small creatures. They have squeaky voices, and then they have hearing that's sensitive in that squeaky region uh, appropriately. We have time for one more question. Anybody got one more question? I'm going to get right down front here. Oh, this is a quick one. Do you help uh, write some of the equations for, and I know DreamWorks at the end of most of their movies, they show leaves being blown in the wind and grass swaying and sometimes water flowing down a brook. Do you help the uh, guys that write the software come up with the equations to make that uh, an automated process? Uh, it, it turns out, I don't have to because they, they have PhD scientists that, that do that, that software. Um, many of them uh, coming from uh, Caltech or uh, other places. So uh, my, my role is usually working directly with the artists who um, are trying to create something uh, so they can, do, they can do the simulation. They have the folks that, that create the simulations, and, and they do an amazing job with that. Uh, but there's so many things that have to be uh, hand-tailored and uh, created by hand um, or, or um, artistic designs. So, so I mostly work um, with the artist. Now, my own, my own research is in uh, fluid simulations. And so at one point, I took the guys with the PhDs from DreamWorks and brought them to, to Berkeley, which is where I do most of my, my research, and, and had them meet with the group that I work with in, in Berkeley. And we basically discovered that the simulation uh, techniques used by DreamWorks and, and used in Berkeley were basically the same. Um, the main difference is uh, the simulations for DreamWorks had to look really good uh, and run really fast, but the, the smoke and the water didn't have to be exactly physically accurate. Um, in Berkeley, if, if you're designing something like a heart valve, uh, it's got to actually <laughs> work correctly. It doesn't matter how it looks. So, so the, there, were, there were some differences, but there was more commonality than than difference in terms of uh, how they do fluid simulation, stuff like that. Gene, we're going to finish up with you. OK, I got a short one here. But just closure on this uh, science thing with uh, vocally, would, they, would a small animal speak at a higher cadence uh, faster than, a, than a, what for us would be a normal person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, with a higher frequency, you would think they would, they would tend to have a higher cadence. And they have a. They, uh, everything about their um, internal clock is faster. Their, their heart rate is, is faster. So, um, and, and that usually controls sort of how frisky the animal is. So small you know, creatures are, are friskier. So you would think they would probably be fast talkers. Um, again, something relatively unappealing to, uh, to have if you take it to realistic uh, proportions. So I think there's a moral to the story, Tucker and Dr. Garcia. You can be a scientist, and you can still have a lot of fun. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're doing it right. All right. So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and our special guests.